Welcome to Night Hacking at the JFocus Conference. My name's Stephen Chin. I'm the Java Community Manager, and I am joined by Mark Heckler, IoT enthusiast. How are you doing, Mark? Fine. How are you? Very good. Very good. So every time I, I see you somewhere in the world, you have, you have interesting toys and devices. So what, what, did, you, what did you bring to... What, what's, your current, what's your current IoT project of the day? Well, actually, I have uh, a couple of three projects I'm working on, but I brought the, uh, the trappings for one of them with me. I didn't bring any small devices, nothing to get confiscated en route. Nice. Uh, but uh, I do tie back to it, all to my um, renewable energy system in St. Louis, uh, Missouri, USA. So everything is remote, but it's still, I think, kind of interesting and kind of informative. Oh, cool. So it's like a remote... IoT demo. Yes. Okay, so I put your I put your slides up. Now you're on. Oh, excellent. So what can go wrong, right? Everything. What could possibly What could possibly <laughs> go wrong? Uh, I I actually delivered this talk this morning. Had a great crowd, uh, very engaged. Some really good discussion that took place throughout and afterward, and uh, we're kind of continuing the discussion on Twitter. It's it's um, uh, you know a really uh, you know as as everyone's pretty much aware, the Internet of Things is kind of an exploding market. Uh, you have a lot of applications in industrial, the industrial space. Uh, you have a lot of uh, everything from very tiny hobbyist type of installs all the way up to very large, uh, you know, Fortune 500, Fortune 100 companies in the U.S. and, and yeah. global, uh, globally dominant companies who are implementing IoT installs. So, um, I, what I tried to do is take it from a little bit more macro uh, view and then drive in from there, because so many times when you think of an IoT, an Internet of Things. Uh, system, you're thinking about the T, the things. And the things are kind of one small component within the much larger uh, system. That's why internet comes first, because the connectivity, the, the cloud uh, storage of data, connectivity, the communication, the analysis, um, uh, that all is, is kind of key to getting the full value of an IoT system. Cool. So that's kind of where I, I came from in the, uh, the talk. Okay, so um, what's, your, what's your renewable energy system? What does it do? Well, I, I started off with a, uh, and that's kind of my pilot project. I, I created it in such a way that it, it bears a lot of uh, scalability. Uh, it, it bears a lot of relevance in terms of how you would structure an industrial type of system. So it's not always the smallest, fastest, uh, most um, efficient or, or least number of devices type of install. But I started off with um, some photovoltaic panels and a small wind turbine. And of course, when you produce energy, yeah. You either consume it immediately, the current that flows from, for instance, when the sun is shining, when a, a, the sun hits a solar panel, it produces current. And that current is either consumed immediately or you have to find a way to store it. So therefore, you typically buy a battery or a, what usually happens is a, a, an array of batteries to create your storage array. And, and you store that power so you can use it at a time when the sun isn't shining or the wind isn't blowing. And once I had that system in place, at least the initial system with a single panel and a small turbine, uh, I started realizing that, of course, first, you want to grow it. That's just the start. But secondly, what happens um, when the power dips below a certain amount? And in normal batteries, like a car battery, it's, it's not a deep cycle battery, so you, you don't get to, to, uh, to deplete the battery very much before you damage the battery. Yeah. A deep cycle battery or a series of batteries, you can draw down much uh, much lower and then recharge fully and, and you have no damage um, uh, within reason. But over time, you can actually draw those down too much if you have too much of a drain and not enough power coming in. So I wanted to be able to monitor so, so that in some way. So you have to monitor and stop it at a certain threshold? Exactly. You, you okay. have certain things in place that are not computerized, like a charge controller, and that can start as simple as a blocking diode where you just don't let the current flow backward, if you will. Yeah. Uh, when the sun isn't shining, you don't want your batteries to drain through your panels and things of that nature. But a charge controller adds a little bit of intelligence to that, but it gives you no monitoring capability. I see. So I needed some kind of a sensor. In my mind, I needed a sensor that would allow me to monitor the voltage levels of my storage array. And if the voltage levels got to the point that there could be battery damage, I wanted to know about it before something bad happened. And that was kind of the start. I, I got a voltage meter, a voltage sensor. And then, of course, you have to get those readings somehow mm -hmm. and monitor them. So, uh, you know, I started, I worked with actually a, a counterpart in uh, Spain and we did some of the initial work on this at a much 
a different, in a much different approach. Uh, I've since taken all of the back end and the front end uh, into the cloud, uh, which gives a lot more flexibility and capabilities. But um, I've added sensors as well, and I, I kind of have a slide that gives, goes into that a little bit. Okay, yeah, let's, um, look at your, let's look at your sensors. Yeah, I, I do, before I get into that, though, I want to kind of cover, uh, and I'll skip, skip ahead with some of this, but I do want to kind of cover what all is involved in a typical Internet of Things system. Uh, I, it's, so it's very octopuses, difficult. octopuses, those are involved? <laughs> yes, that's an essential element. Uh, it, it's hard to describe an IoT system, but kind of the best that I can do with this is that uh, if you imagine a giant octopus and the tentacles of that giant octopus, those are your devices. Those are the things that interact with the physical world. So those are the things out there that you're trying to gain control of as they flail about in the physical world. You typically have some kind of a microcontroller or some... Um, so in the I, octopus case, it's a very micro, yes. micro controller. <laughs> But, but you have to have something that effectively loops and interacts with your various devices through I, IO, uh, GPIO ports, whatnot. And, and then you, you usually have some kind of an IoT gateway, which is a more capable device that handles security and communication and transformation and things like that. So you can uh, use one gateway to interact with multiple microcontrollers and devices. So it's like and the octopus armor? That's, that's the mind control device on our giant mind octopus. Mind control yes, device. Yes, yes, oh. we'd have to have some kind of mind control. And, and, and these levels can be compacted, they can be collapsed. Uh, and you're seeing more of that as we go along, but, but in industrial systems, you typically want more flexibility, more capabilities, and, and there are always trade-offs with any approach. Yeah. I like this approach because it gives the maximum flexibility, but it is a little more complex. So as the state of the industry improves and more options become available, uh, you're, you're going to see more collapsing as we go. But. And then, of course, everything has to come up to a back-end service because you have to store the data, retrieve the data. Yep. Uh, you have to be able to analyze that data and make decisions based upon it. And then you have to have a front-end service of some kind uh, with a great user interface so you can <laughs> lend meaning to all of the data that you're collecting. So that's, that's kind of the scope. Everybody thinks of the one little thing at the beginning, the tentacles, but they forget all of everything yeah. else that goes into the entire system. Um, and, and the way I typically break it down is, is kind of in, the, in, in a domain-driven design type of approach with bounded context, because the US or the EU, you, you have, uh, rather than treat things at the macro level in all ways, you have certain contexts that apply, uh, things that will apply to the populace of a particular member state, and then you'll have things that they cooperate with to accomplish at a larger scale. Yep. Um, and the same thing with the systems. If you break them down and have defined APIs so they communicate over defined APIs, then you can get a lot more uh, velocity as you develop and a lot more rigor with your development process. So uh, getting to the physical devices, uh, in addition to the voltage, what I, I like to uh, capture on a second by second basis yeah, is this looks the, like you have winds, yep, wind yep. measurements, light, wind. what else you got there? wind direction and, and speed, uh, as well as rainfall, and uh, temperature, humidity, ambient uh, lighting. Is this, is this one? Which one's for rainfall? Uh, rainfall is this guy. Oh, it, that it's guy. a uh, little rocker, and it's sensitive to a tenth of a, an inch. Okay. So fairly small amount of rainfall sets it off and then makes the system do something, which I'll come Got to it. in a minute. <laughs> But I also keep track of uh, luminosity, the ambient lighting, the atmospheric pressure, so you can kind of see when storm fronts are coming in and out. Um, and then uh, with the temperature and humidity, the microcontroller actually monitors and keeps it within a range. If it drops too low, it kicks on a small heat lamp to keep the ambient air, the air around the uh, systems at a certain level yep. or reasonable. And then in the summertime, St. Louis summertime, where temperatures can exceed 100 degrees Fahrenheit on days, uh, it, uh, it blows a fan across the whole equipment stack and then extends the actuators to open and close the windows. So there are windows in my utility shed where the whole system is fielded and the windows open and the fan blows and it keeps it at least moderately reasonable for the equipment. I, I've been running this almost four years and have never had a microcontroller or a gateway failure. Okay, so that's, that's pretty, pretty robust. reliable. Pretty robust. How do you weatherproof your... Um, Electronics. Well, everything is inside except for the the external portion uh, of the weather stack, the weather okay, station. Okay, so you, you just have it wired inter, in, to an internal enclosure. Yes, so to yes. your house. 
Uh, well, it's, it's self-contained um, based on requirements, and in this varies by state by state, so this is one of those bounded contexts. Uh, you are not able to, to connect to the power grid and sell power back unless you have fully uh, government approved panels and every component of your system. And of course, I've been trying to assemble this to experiment with it. And yeah. many, many times you, you buy things that just haven't been gone through the UL process for approval. So I, I use it for my workshop there. I use okay. it for powering the shed, but I don't use it to back feed into the house or the, got the it. grid. Got it. I could, but I'd have to multiply my costs of the system by about 10. <laughs> to get the proper certifications. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it gets kind of costly. But it's a great proof of concept, and again, all of the, the lessons that you learn scale quite nicely. Yeah, yeah that's pretty cool. Um, so that's an Arduino. Got yeah. little microcontrollers and other stuff, and that all, that all applies to other sort of projects you're working on. Yep, uh, use the microcontroller for the grunt work, interacting with the devices. Uh, use a uh, Raspberry Pi for the IoT gateway, which allows me to connect, patch, push code to the Raspberry Pi, as well as to the Arduinos. Yeah. So everything is, is fully remotely controllable and patchable. I always think of uh, James Gosling and Liquid Robotics. You know, their, their drones are halfway around the world and in the middle of the ocean, any ocean. So if, if they have an equipment failure, that's a real problem. If they need to push an update, uh, that's a real problem if they haven't designed the system right. And even with IoT systems that are not on a seagoing drone, they're typically stuck up in a corner of a warehouse uh, near a ceiling or, or behind a panel somewhere. So they're not easily accessible. The last thing yeah. in the world you want is a, a device to fail or to have to extract that, pull down a system and So patch. reliability is a primary concern. Absolutely. And then getting into the, uh, the back end and the front end services, um, I, I mean, it doesn't have to necessarily be a, a huge and expansive service to start off with, but what you need is reliability and the capability to uh, communicate with your IoT systems and store the data and allow you to retrieve it and manipulate it and, and analyze it in some way. Yeah. Um, I'm using Spring Boot for the uh, application, for a cloud native application that lets me deploy it very easily and quickly to uh, Cloud Foundry, uh, cool. which has a really streamlined user interface, developer interface. Uh, from the command line that lets you, you know, focus on your business value and not on your mechanics and trying to get your operations behind the scenes to work. Very nice. So, a um, little bit of show and tell. Uh, I do want to um, just try to connect here. Oh, good. That's always a good sign. Yeah, so you should increase your font size. Control or Command Plus. Yeah, okay. A few times. Um, bigger. There and, you go. And that even bigger. It's that's not gonna actually do much for us at this point, but <laughs> yeah. but what I wanted to show is that um, you can with the Raspberry Pi running Raspbian, you have full capability to secure shell into your device, which I'm doing here in St. Louis from Stockholm. Uh, you have the ability to set up an FTP server if you want. Yeah. You can VNC in right to the desktop, which I'm going to do right now. Uh, this is something you don't want to leave running all the time for your, your attack profile, because leaving that running means that somebody else, if they um, can get through your router, through your port forwarding, they can actually access it. So it's something that I fire up and then shut down when I'm done. But I'm sitting here on the desktop of my oh. IoT gateway right now. Very nice. And. Um, while I pull this up, because this is one of those extra nice things that you just can't always do if you have a collapsed system. But here you have, um, I can't do it on that. Let's see, oops, too much. Okay, that gives us something. This is the sketch, the program that I'm running on my um, uh, microcontroller yeah. out in my powerhouse. So it's the Arduino sketch. Mm -hmm. I'm, I can pull the same sketch up through my IoT gateway. And if I find something that's wrong with the code, something's not acting the way I want it, want it to, even with, if I've extensively tested it, uh, but as soon as I deploy it, if something is not right, I can go through and I can make the changes, I can rebuild it, I can push it to my Arduino. Yeah and everything runs just fine. So it gives you a lot of capability that is, is really kind of nice to have. 
I'm going to go ahead and shut this down now uh, because, oops. Oh, come on. But um, what I want to show you next is just fire up the... Um, I have some scripts set up to kind of make it uh, a little faster to get started. I normally use a, uh, an extended keyboard, so this is tough. <laughs> and then I also have a, a camera that lets us take a look into the, the yeah. utility shed so we can see what's going on. I like to also be able to um, stream the log file and take a look at it as I go. So you can see that these uh, are the readings that are... You can see the raw are, readings mm -hmm. coming in off the Arduino communication, is that? There, it's through the Arduino and the serial connection from the Arduino to yeah. the uh, gateway, which is the Pi. And then the Pi transforms the data and sends it via WebSocket connection uh, to the uh, cloud service running in Cloud Foundry. And then what it does, because as it's, uh, it's, it's still reading, getting the readings, but it's not sending them yet. It's sending every fifth reading, actually. I okay. forgot to mention that. You can define that as well. But I'm connecting to a uh, data endpoint, WebSocket, and a control WebSocket. I keep them separate for security because there will be some clients you want to be able to read the data without manipulating the devices themselves. Um, here's a blog post I can come back to here in a little while. I was going to mention. Um, but... This is the uh, user interface, the front-end service that I use. Nice. And this gives you an idea of, of what you're seeing. Oh, and you even have a set of like a Pi camera? Mm-hmm. Cool. So, so this lets me get some visual feedback as well. And I can monitor temperature, humidity, voltage, uh, the ambient lighting, wind speed. And you can see the voltage hop around a little bit when it gets maybe a, a bit of sunlight or a gust of wind. It, it uh, feeds some current to the battery, and it pops the voltage a bit. Uh, yep. I, I have an automated mode, which kind of runs on its own based on certain temperature criteria and rainfall. If, if it's not raining and the temperature exceeds a certain limit, it opens the windows. If it gets even a tenth of an inch of rain, it shuts the windows because you don't want your equipment flooded or anything. Cool. Uh, but then it waits a predefined amount of time. Uh, I programmed, I think, an hour in, a delay into it, and then it reopens everything. This time of year, you don't have to worry about that. Yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty cool. So you're, you're basically controlling... A an IoT system halfway around the world via the mm -hmm. cloud. And the, and the response time is really good. Part of that is, is Cloud Foundry really is a pretty peppy platform, but also the, the communication is very efficient. WebSocket is much less wordy, less talkative than a REST API is. Yeah. And for this, that's, that's kind of critical because you're passing small bits of data. You don't want several hundred bytes framing each one. Uh, I turned on the heat lamp. So you get, uh, obviously, the lumens uh, popped quite a bit, the, uh, the ambient lighting. I can shut that off. It has a status lamp that comes on when nothing else is on. I can shut that off. I override that if I choose. Uh, I can also kick on the interior light, which is kind of nice if you go out at night and you don't want to have to carry a, a flashlight out. You just kick on yep. the uh, fluorescent lamp on it. Um, I have not that bad. independent of the automation uh, because I want to be able to do that if it's automated or not. Uh, but then I kick it back over to automated mode and it just kind of runs itself. Cool. Oh, that's an awesome demo. <laughs> so it's kind of fun. I, I did write a, a blog post uh, just a couple of weeks ago about uh, Spring Boot for IoT developers. Yep. Um, a lot of people who work with IoT, again, kind of focus and fixate on the, the things. But again, you're going to need to do something with that data. You're going to need to ma manage it somehow. And Spring Boot's kind of a neat way to get started quickly and, and have a productive tool. Don't want to make it into too much of a commercial, but it's just a, a really effective tool for spinning up backends quickly yeah. and effectively. So. So, um, cool. If, uh, no, that's exciting. So you've been doing a lot of work since you know, last time we were hanging out. A lot of fun, and and uh, you know the the wonderful thing about IoT is that it does apply in so many different ways. Um, I th I mentioned to you before we came on camera that I have a, a small wheeled robot I'm going to be presenting uh, in an upcoming conference, and I have an onboard sensor array on that, all the different sensors, including a Geiger counter. Yeah. And again, all that data has to go somewhere. You have to, in order to have any value at all, you have to see it in real time or near real time so you can do something about it and act on it. And um, it's just, it's a lot of fun, but if you do your projects right, it's extremely scalable as well. Cool. Well, thank you.
Thank you, sir. Very much for doing the interview, and that's an awesome project. I'm now inspired. I think, <laughs> I think well, I've got an extra chapter for my next book. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, I draw a lot of inspiration from your projects and the books, so yeah, keep them coming. Um, for the folks at JFocus, we're going to be having our next interview with the VJUG coming up at um, 4.50. So join us for that. That's a Java EE book club. And if you're watching online, you can see all of the additional broadcasts at nighthacking.com. So all of the um, sessions here are live streamed and also recorded for later viewing. So, Thank you very much and enjoy the, the rest of the conference. Thank you.